Well, good afternoon or good morning for those um, out on the western part of the United States or Canada. My name is Matthew Wicks, and I am Vice President for Strategy and Organizational Development at INA Call, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. As I look at the map for those that have indicated their location, it kind of looks like a weather map to me. Like, you know, we have this um, warm front, you know, coming up from the south all the way, um, beginning to head up into Canada. And I know we have a lot of people from Canada that might not have actually marked their location, but we're great to have the many, great to see the many people from the U.S. that have decided to attend, and of course, the many Canadians that we expected for today's webinar. I just have a few logistics to go over before we uh, start with today's webinar. First of all, I had asked earlier, no one had indicated they were using the phone um, conference line. So I'm just going to check again. If anyone is using the phone conference line, give me a green check. Otherwise, I'm going to disconnect it and um, save the cost of um, having that line um, used throughout the webinar. But um, the session is being recorded. And so if you end up having to miss a portion, if you have to leave early or you just want to review it later, the same email that you received today that gave you the link to the live webinar also has a link to the recording. And that recording will be available probably within 30 minutes of the end of the webinar. It, the room has to be vacant for, I think, 15 to 30 minutes, and then that recording um, becomes available. In addition, we post the recording as well as a PDF version of the slides that you see today in the INA Call Webinar Archive site. The INA Call Webinar Archive site is part of the INA Call Online Forums, which is a password protected area that um, that will be that um, can be accessible to any INA Call members. Um, and I'm just seeing a question from Michael to me since this is a free webinar. Um, the recording link can be made um, public. And Michael, if you want to publish that in your blog, I don't think we have any specific plans of publishing it publicly just because we don't have a, um, a logical place for that. But you feel free to share um, that link with anyone because this is a free um, webinar. So those are some of the logistics for the webinar today. Just a few announcements. Well, today is what we call a special edition webinar. That just means it isn't part of one of our regular webinar series. You can see that we do have two regular webinar series that meet nearly every month. There's occasionally reasons why we don't have them. But we have a leadership webinar series, which meets the second Wednesday of the month, and a teacher talk series, which meets the third Thursday of the month. And the idea behind those two series is the leadership webinar series topics are chosen that we think will be of interest to leaders or administrators of online programs, and then the teacher talk series of topics that would be of interest to online teachers. And we schedule that one a little bit later in the day because often online teachers are also classroom teachers and may not be able to attend as easily during the regular work day. There are no credentials that have to um, be shown to attend one of those. So if you're not an online teacher, you're more than welcome to attend the teacher talk series, and you don't have to be a leader of an online program to attend the leadership webinar series. We're in the process of confirming up all of our sessions for the winter and spring. And so that's why it says topic to be determined, but you can see the dates um, for February. And you see the URL in front of you for all of our events. So probably in the next couple of weeks, information about those two webinars in March and April and at least through May will be posted there so that you can um, plan ahead and see what's going to be discussed over the next several months. Of course, the biggest event that INA Call holds every year is the Virtual School Symposium. In 2012, it's going to be held a little bit earlier than it has in the past several years. It's um, moving back into late October. It's going to be in New Orleans. And if you look at the length of it, it is a little bit longer than it has been in the past. Um, October 21st will be the conference workshop 
day, and then the 22nd through the 24th will be the main conference. The 24th will be just a half day. It will be going until lunchtime, and that's the addition to the conference, so expanding it by a half day. You see the URL for the website, vss.inacall.org, and the website just went live earlier this week, so um, there's still more information that will be added later, but basic information as far as dates and pricing is now available on the website. Some basic information about the hotel venue and other things as far as registration will come later. Uh, one thing that I do want to alert people that might be interested in submitting a proposal for one of the breakout sessions, the RFP for that will go out sometime next month. We don't have an exact release date, but it will be sometime in February. And those will be due back sometime in April, probably around the middle of the month. Um, we are um, responding to some of the feedback that we received in the evaluations and the types of um, sessions that people are looking for and making some modica modifications to our breakout sessions um, and the RFP related to that. So that's why it's not quite available right now. But we do encourage you to submit a uh, proposal if you are interested in speaking to one of those sessions. Just be aware that the competition is pretty fierce. Last year we received nearly 300 um, session proposals and we only had 120 slots available. Um, I think that takes care of the announcements and the last item that I need to um, do before I turn it over to our speakers is just to thank Blackboard for providing the facilities for today's webinars and all webinars that INACAL offers. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Barber, who was the author of the Canada Report, and he will introduce himself and the panelists that he has assembled. Actually, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves uh, when we get to that point. Uh, basically, sort of the format for today is I wanted to give a, a brief overview of the report, and then I've got a couple of questions that I've prepared in advance for uh, the panelists, but in all honesty, we've got a relatively small group here compared to what I was expecting, so um, I'm more than happy to sort of deviate from those questions and uh, take questions from the audience as we get them, but we can manage that as we get there. Um, so, and again, I'll introduce the folks in a second here now. Um, just to give you a sense, this is the fourth year that we've actually done this report, and you can see the, the covers there. Um, Wendy and Allison have been quite helpful in helping me change the color at the top every year to make it look good. And um, I'm, before I guess I get into the content, uh, I need to thank the sponsors who have made this report possible. Um, this past year, it was uh, Connections Academy, uh, Heritage Christian Schools out of British Columbia, and uh, Digital Inc. Uh, what I always find interesting is every year that we've had sponsorship, um, the majority of the sponsors have actually come from the United States, which uh, I've always found interesting about a Canadian report. Um, over the four years, we've actually been fortunate in that we've got a great deal of cooperation from the various ministries and departments of education across the country. And as of this year, we've actually had every single ministry that has participated at one time or another. Um, in addition to that, there have been some great key stakeholders in each of the provinces. In fact, some of them are actually, um, um, I guess, audience members here in the room today um, that have helped, uh, which has been particularly helpful when the um, the the ministries have uh, been bogged down in, in some of the bureaucratic permissions because even the years that ministries haven't participated it isn't because that they haven't wanted to in most cases it's because the level of permission that's required um, in some jurisdictions from above the individuals responsible for distance education uh, can be a bit of a headache for those involved. Um, so, looking at, I guess, the national picture, I'm going to give uh, two slides on this. The first looks at regulations and the type of regulations that exist. And for those of you more familiar with the U.S. context, um, it shouldn't be surprising that in Canada, like in the U.S., um, you know, different provinces, in the same way that different states, have different legislative and regulatory regimes. Um, the three most common regimes that um, we've got in Canada are ones where it's actually embedded into the legislation. In some cases that means in terms of the, the, the legislative collective agreement. 
um, that is in place. Um, in some cases, it's, it's individual policy regulations uh, that are maintained either by the ministry or in some cases by the individual programs, um, particularly when those programs are being managed from the department or from the ministry. And then in the case of the, the three territories and Prince Edward Island, what you get is, is memorandums of understanding. Uh, that they sign into, so from one territory to a province. So, for example, um, in the case of the Yukon, uh, they have a, a memorandum of understanding with several organizations in British Columbia to help provide um, distance education there, plus they've got their own small program. One of the other things that you'll note is that there's a number of provinces where there are no real regulation at all. As Darren indicates, and uh, he's coming to us from Saskatchewan there, which is over for the American folks, uh, over on the western side of the country, um, and it's one of those areas that does have no uh, regulation whatsoever. And I should point out that the level of regulation really isn't tied to the amount of activity going on there. So if you look, British Columbia is I would suggest one of the most heavily regulated areas, but it's also the area that has the highest proportion of K-12 online learning activity or K-12 distance ed activity there. Ontario also has a very high level of uh, proportion-wise of K-12 distance education going on, um, which you know is is an area that has uh, some significant policy regulations. Alberta. And Quebec also have high levels uh, proportionally of distance ed occurring. And you notice those are two jurisdictions where there are no regulations whatsoever. So the amount of regulation really hasn't had an impact on the level of activity. Now speaking of that level of activity, um, I won't go through the numbers for each of the provinces. You can just download the report and get that at the table in the first couple of pages there. Um, as I mentioned, BC has the most. Uh, just about every pro uh, province and territory has something going on, although this past year Nunavut didn't um, have any listed uh, according to their ministry. But you can see again, like you'd find in, in the United States, there uh, tends to be a variety of things happening from um, you know in places like Alberta where you've got a very healthy and very substantial province-wide program, but also a lot of district-based programs. And in all honesty, oops, I just lost my page here. Um, thank you. Uh, in all honesty, some level of a uh, fair level of blended learning activity going on. Um, the same thing that you have, for example, in um, Quebec, where you've got three or four programs that are operating on a provincial scope, but they're they're not being run by the province. And you see a, a fair amount of, of blended learning occurring in those jurisdictions as well. So there's a great variety there from provinces that just have single programs to uh, provinces that have uh, individual um, province-wide programs and district-based programs, ones that have just district-based programs, and then as I mentioned earlier, the territories in Nunavut primarily use programs from other provinces, although you'll notice that the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and PEI kind of have that striped green there, and that's because they have their own um, smaller programs. In the case of the Yukon and PEI, they have these smaller um, video conferencing programs. In the case of the Northwest Territories, uh, there's an organization, actually it's a school council called the Beaufort Delta Educational Council that's been experimenting with a couple of online courses. So while they do use a significant number of programs from other jurisdictions, um, you know, they, they have a um, starting of their own particular programs. So actually I'll flip back here just to the main screen for a second. Um, so joining us today here now, we'll move to the, the panel portion. Um, like I said, I've got a couple of questions to start us off, but uh, if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand or type it in the, the text box there, and I'll try to manage them to the group. Uh, we've got Morris Berry, uh, who is a program uh, coordinator with the Center for Distance Learning and Innovation, and Morris has been involved in, in distance education in Newfoundland. Uh, for quite a long time, back when they used to use the old audio graphic system and right through to the present. Uh, Sarah Hainsworth, who's with the Department of Education in Nova Scotia, who's overseeing some exciting initiatives here now in, in, um, in the province as they've moved from a district-based operation of, the, um, of their, their online programs to a more centralized 
operation that comes out of the department. So it's it's interesting times for those folks in Nova Scotia. Uh, Darren Cannell, who is uh, at the he's the principal of the Saskatoon Catholic Cyber School, um, who is um, also a doc student at an online university himself, and his uh, research is actually focusing upon things that they're doing at the cyber school. And uh, next to me, he's probably the most active K-12 online learning blogger that's out there. And we've also got Tim Lincolnman, uh, who's also with the BC Ministry of Education. So we've got two departmental officials here today. Um, as I mentioned, BC is, is the jurisdiction that has the greatest amount of uh, regulations. So you've got some interesting things happening there. The 2011 report focused upon the issue of, I think it was funding uh, in British Columbia, and I believe the 2010 report focused upon the issue of, of quality assurance uh, that you have in British Columbia. So two good legislative models um, that people might want to look into or might want to ask Tim a little bit about today. So I guess to get us started, I will Essentially, before I ask any questions, so I'll, I'll give them a chance to sort of introduce themselves a little bit and maybe provide a little bit of background on, you know, who they are, what their programs are, kind of thing, and, and then we can get either to these questions or questions that the audience might have. Uh, so, being a Newfoundlander, I'm going to be biased here and go east to west. So, uh, Morris, why don't you start us off here? All right, let's do it. Thank you, Mike, and, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. I have a couple of slides that will introduce a couple of topics I want to talk about, but the, I'd like you to take a look at that picture, and can you give me a check mark if you think that, play, that picture is awesome? <laughs> okay, it's, thank you for the check marks. Um, that's Francois. You might say it's Francois, but if you've ever been to Quebec, you'll know that, yep, it's Francois. Uh, it's a fjord at the uh, southwest uh, corner of our province. And no, uh, there are no roads to be seen. Uh, that picture was taken from a helicopter, and uh, we actually, um, on the way along, we actually had to land briefly um, because uh, we had some drafts. I put a little dot where we landed. And yep, we had to let two people out while the helicopter took a look down to see if it was safe to land. It wasn't, and we actually came back two weeks later. That's what we deal with. Look, up on the hill, way over here where I'm putting this out, there actually is an emplacement that has a windmill. And um, that's how we power the radio transmitter that's also up on that hill. And from that radio transmitter, we pick up uh, one third of a, of a T1 line from way out in the bay, uh, 512K, that's how we feed that community. And uh, we, we send 512K frame relay down into the bowl and we use that for, uh, for getting our distance education. Why do we do that? Well, that community is self-sustaining. Um, it's, it's economically viable uh, through various ways and means, as you can probably guess fishing is one of them. That community is able to uh, sustain itself and the people who are there really like living there and they love their kids, they don't want to send them away. So that's fairly typical of what we deal with. We actually deal with 103 schools and in our province distance education is not an option. I work for something called the Center for Distance Learning and Innovation. It's, it's part of the uh, the Ministry of Education, and we've been created primarily to deal with distance education in our province in a rural setting because we have needs here. I, my picture of Francois showed you what our needs are. Take a quick look at the island part of our province, and 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 the dots represent communities. The dots also are color coded by connection type. Red means fiber. Uh, the bluish color means frame relay. Uh, you can see the whole outline of our province. That's the schools we deal with. These, these are small communities with an ever declining population of, of students who, uh, who depend upon us. Look at Labrador, it's the same deal. We only have about 50,000 people living in Labrador in nearly three times the size of the island part of the province. We have some, uh, some challenges with delivering education, let's just say. Uh, despite that, um, we actually have, um, in, in the 103 schools, we actually have about 1,000 students altogether, 
Uh, we also uh, we also have um, about 30 courses that we that we deliver um, all around. And take a look at a couple of them. I really would like to draw attention to a couple that you may not expect to see there. Look, we're able to deliver art, and when I say art technologies, I don't mean Photoshop. Um, An art technology, uh, yeah, it does include Photoshop, but it could also mean pastels. It could mean paints and so on. We have a, a portfolio course, art and design. Um, applied music, we have three sections of applied music. We teach students how to play guitar. We teach students uh, also how to play piano. We do it live. We have some skilled trades and so on. In order to pull that off, we have to use a fairly complex system. We actually use a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, we, we use desire to learn for our uh, asynchronous, and uh, it, it serves our needs rather well. Um, we also, uh, well, here we are at Illuminate Live, and we'd be dead in the water if not for Illuminate Live. Um, why do we use these two tools? Well, two important things. Important thing number one is that people all learn differently, and we, we, we have to make sure that we, we tend to a variety of learning styles and so on. Um, so between using Illuminate Live for synchronous uh, video conference for, for certain courses, such as the music courses, someone I showed you, and putting asynchronous content into our desire to learn, we, we feel that we can pretty well hit everybody's learning style to the best that we can possibly do. Now, uh, a couple, this is the couple of things I have to mention. Mike said, look, things that you like. Well, I like the fact that we support our students. I listed some things that we work at very hard to make sure our students are supported because, look, most of our kids are grade 10, 11, and 12, and, and they need help. They need to be kept motivated. They need, they, they need academic help. Well, I think we do a pretty good job of doing that. So I'm happy with that part. What am I not particularly happy about? Well, two areas. I, I know Mike only gave me one, but I, I'm going to take two. One is that our connectivity is not right where I like it to be. We still have, out of our 103 schools, we have 38 of them that are not on fiber. And of course, that limits, to a large extent, what we can do. The second is content. Uh, people don't seem to get the message, and I mean people all around the world, that asynchronous learning content is hard to do, hard to get right, hard to develop, and it's expensive. People think you can throw teachers in and say, oh, develop content, go teach it. Well, I'm afraid it's not like that, and we know that rather well. And I really was glad the other day that finally someone like Apple stepped in. Um, my jury's still out as to whether or not they can pull off uh, what's ultimately going to cost a billion dollars. Uh, thank you. That's my little spiel to get started, and let's move on. Okay, I'll hand it over to Sarah now. Thank you very much. I don't have pictures of wonderful things like uh, Morris did, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, distance education in Nova Scotia. It has a long and storied uh, evolution that dates from 1917 was the first uh, correspondence study courses were implemented, and it has traveled through educational radio, educational television. Uh, the very first network, Nova Scotia, which was in about 1995, which used um, conference telephones and a very early iteration of the internet. And then it has uh, evolved into the current um, format that we now use, which is uh, synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, high school courses taught over uh, Moodle is our asynchronous platform, and we use a product called Via, which comes from uh, SVI Inc. I think is the name of the company in Quebec, which is uh, the synchronous video conferencing platform that we use. Um, one thing that is going really right with with uh, online learning in Nova Scotia is the cooperative relationship that the department and the school boards have. Um, built over many, many years of uh, working together. Nova Scotia is a small province, and uh, we can't afford to duplicate efforts. So we're very lucky to have uh, expertise around the province and people willing to uh, work really hard on behalf of the whole province, not just their school board. Um, we have managed to build a very nice 
strong infrastructure for the whole province, which includes all schools uh, wired, all uh, schools with access to Moodle and VIA, um, and we have a very interesting uh, structure within the virtual school right now. So our teachers are not employed by the Department of Education. They're employed within a, within their own school board, and they are supervised within their own school board, but they teach courses for the virtual school. So it's a, a very interesting, delicate relationship that we have, and it, it requires a lot of um, it requires a lot of goodwill and cooperation on the part of everybody that's involved. Uh, the thing that we're still struggling with when it comes to distance education in our province is, as I mentioned, the uh, delicate dance that we dance. And it's caused by um, a part uh, section of the teacher's professional agreement, which, uh, is, which is called Article 49, which uh, sets out the way that teachers work within Nova Scotia and basically they say the article says that teachers work for us they are employed in a school in a school board uh, the department can't run a school so they also are uh, allowed to teach during the school day during the school year so that presents some challenges that we are trying to figure out a way of coping with um, in terms of uh, how do we deal with things like uh, constant intake. Right now the courses are tied to the semester in the school year. The, the kids can only enroll in September and February because the teachers can only teach between September and June. So that's part of the regulatory infrastructure that we're trying to work with. And uh, we anticipate, hopefully, that that will modif be modified as we go along. Um, I'm looking at the questions. The professional development for teachers is uh, provided by us. Often it's by invitation only, or it's by invitation and it's, it's, um, it is optional and it is sometimes offered during the summer or on weekends so that it falls outside of the regular professional development that's provided to the teachers and their school boards. Again, that's just part of the dance that we do. Um, we are very fortunate to have, this year we have seven online teachers who are um, incredibly committed. They work in three separate school boards. Next year we'll have eight teachers from four school boards. Um, and we're very fortunate to have received funding this year from the government that has enabled us to consolidate the virtual school. And that's my spiel. I will hand the mic back to uh, Michael. Hello, um, this is uh, Darren Cadell speaking. Sorry, not calling. I'm uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, we have a population of uh, approximately one million people in Saskatchewan. In our province, we've had the distance learning for forever, for about 80, 90 years since they've been doing the paper-based uh, learning. We got into the virtual online learning in 1999. Our school started uh, at the same time as the province started their school. Um, we started about six months before, and in retrospect, if we would have not started at that time, we would have waited for the province to begin theirs, and we would have worked with the province a little bit more than we did. Did, However, in 2009-2010, the ministry decided to uh, allow the distance learning to go back to the school divisions. Since the school divisions are the ones that are actually in charge of teaching, they decided they're better suited to handle the distance learning and the online learning in the province had gone to such a point that there was uh, little pockets all over in each one of the divisions of people who were trained on how to use, at that time, Blackboard or other products and other learning management systems that were out there. Um, during that whole time, so for the last 12 years or so, the Saskatoon Catholic Cyber School, which is the one that I've been in charge of since its inception, um, has continued to grow and 
and 2009, all of a sudden, we had a fair amount of interest from some of the other divisions, and we went from being 80% of the students within our school coming from within within our division, suddenly we're 50-50 and we have 50% of our students come from within our division and 50% come from outside of our division. The, in our province we have approximately 3,000 online students. Uh, last year the Saskatoon Catholic Cyber School taught approximately 1,700 of those students. Uh, we are an asynchronous asynchronous system with uh, 44 different teachers. Our teachers all teach within our division and also about 80% of those teachers teach in the face-to-face -face schools as well. So they take the expertise that they learn on how to use technology in the classroom. Uh, sorry, it's online. They take that back into the classroom. So it actually has helped our division in that, in that scenario. We um, continue to grow every single year. We write four new courses. Our teachers write their own courses. This year we've moved from uh, WebCT to Moodle. Uh, it was a, a cost thing and Moodle's free and WebCT, which is now Blackboard, has uh, come down with a fairly large uh, price tag on it. So we've, uh, we've gone to that stage. We have an actual online chapel and have a priest attached to our chapel because we are a Catholic school, which is kind of unique. We have a school counselor. Um, we also have three registrars who deal with all the registrations of all the students and then we also have one person who is in charge of the professional development of the teachers that we have online. So that's my office staff and then we at one time tried to centralize the whole cyber school and put us all into one location. We ran into bandwidth issues as we got bigger and bigger and the teachers were commuting over to this school here in Saskatoon because anywhere in Saskatoon is only about 20 minutes away so all the teachers were driving to the central pod system that we had but by the time we put 44 people into the cyber school we weren't uh, we didn't have an area big enough and we also didn't have a bandwidth. Some of the things that are happening in the province that I think are very exciting is the fact that all the other divisions are starting their own courses and there's lots of collaboration going on between the different schools and we have quite often have people come visit us to see how we are doing things and then we learn from them as well as they put their courses together. We have lots of people who are doing synchronous online learning as well as us doing the asynchronous model. Um, there's lots of televised uh, stuff still going on. There's still a lot of print-based stuff going on, which is very exciting in our province. We continue to grow. Um, our division is starting to think about the possibility of uh, making the online a mandatory um, thing within the school division in order to graduate, which I think will be very exciting. That should come down the pipes in a little while. And I'm starting to see a little bit more collaboration between the post-secondary and our K-12 institutions, which again is a very exciting area that we're starting to grow into. Um, because we do asynchronous and we have multiple entry and multiple exits, which means the students can start at any time and finish at any time during the year. We ran into a few issues with the regulatory system that we have. And when I talk about that, I talk about the student, the teachers not teaching in the summer. Um, hopefully in the next, in the very near future, we will start a summer school, online summer school, and then the teachers will be teaching all year round. But that has many union implications and it has many regulatory implications if we get to that stage. So uh, we're still working to the red tape of that. But it will be a very exciting time here in Saskatchewan when we can go all year round and offer credits to students all over the place. We also um, offer a credit recovery program which is very popular down in the United States. We have found that there is a huge uptake on that here within our division and we're hoping in the near future to be able to roll that out. And for those of you that know what that is, um, I have talked about it a fair amount in my blog and I think it's a very, a very valuable tool for the K-12 institutions. But um, that's I think all I have to say. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a bit of background on business learning in BC from the text. You can see that it's um, been here for quite a while, uh, beginning back in 
1919. Um, and it pretty much stayed correspondence for the next several decades. We actually skipped over various broadcast approaches. There wasn't much in the way of radio or television delivery at all in our K-12 um, distance education programs. And in the 1990s, we began the transition to online. Um, there were some pilot programs leading uh, into some work that began in 1993. We had a project called New Directions in Distance Learning. It started with Optel audiographic um, locations in several small and isolated communities in British Columbia, but uh, in the next year or two, we made the quick switch to the internet and worldwide web delivery. And so over, you know, since that early 90s, we've been pretty much dealing with the evolution of um, online technology and new capabilities it brings. Um, in terms of the things we focused on in the report, um, and this has come up earlier along. We do have a lot of activity in what we call distributed learning here in BC. Last year we had nearly 90,000 uh, students from kindergarten to grade 12. Since 1989 and a royal commission, um, all students in the province have the choice of being able to enroll in either a distance school, an independent school, or a public school, or even be homeschooled. Um, and in 2006, new legislation made it even more flexible. It allowed students who were already attending a neighborhood school to take um, other courses for their program from one of the other, uh, from another distance learning program in the province. So we've got a fair bit of choice, and that choice is what's driven the growth in enrollment um, since 2006. We have roughly 55 public distributed learning schools operated by their school districts and uh, an additional uh, 15 or so independent schools also providing distributed learning. One of them was a sponsor of the report as Michael mentioned earlier in the session. So there's an awful lot of activity that's going on. Um, and very little of activity is actually centralized uh, because school districts operate, they're distributed learning schools, they're responsible for professional development and they're also responsible for sourcing content and that comes from several places. Um, many of them have teachers develop their own. Uh, there is a consortium of schools in the province called the BC Learning Network that works together on collaboration of creating content. And there's a government uh, cert content developer called Open School, which has um, been around for quite some time. It was out of the ministry for a while, and now it's back in the ministry that many schools use and modify the um, Open School content. Um, One of the other things that supported the possibility of, of choice here in the province is that we've got a funding model where the dollars basically follow um, the students. So uh, students enrolled in full-time programs, that money flows to the district as a full FTE for the student uh, in that full online program or distributed learning program. But even in terms of partial uh, programs, if a student is taking six courses from a neighborhood school and two courses from a distributed learning school, we know how many courses a student is taking at each school and the funding flows to the students from um, based on that allocation. Uh, the other thing I mentioned in the report is we do have several quality assurance processes. There's a process we have called a quality review. There's separate satisfaction survey for distributed learning schools. Uh, there is an audit program. And there's also, as, as Michael implicated, uh, implied earlier on, we have a fair n bit of regulation, which is primarily captured in a distributed learning agreement that districts need to sign with the province of British Columbia in order to have one of these schools. And there are certain requirements in that agreement that um, uh, they must adhere to and which we uh, monitor from time to time. Um, in terms of, I guess, some of the other things that have come up in this call earlier, because there are so many schools and they get to choose what kind of infrastructure they want to deliver their programs. Uh, we have uh, schools in the province that are using Blackboard, schools that are using Desire to Learn, and we have quite a few schools that are using um, Moodle. Um, the system is designed to be a year-round program, so especially for this 
grade 10 to 12 students uh, based on continuous entry, continuous exit. So we have three funding counts during the course of the year to capture those students so that we can uh, allocate course-based funding based on the flow in and out of, of schools over, um, over time. Oh, and I've seen a comment from Jade about adult education. Our 90,000 students do include a fair number of adults who are coming back to school to complete their graduation requirements. Um, that's free in British Columbia um, up to the point of graduating. And then many schools are also offering courses to adults who are already graduated but um, need to upgrade. Um, rather than deal, wait for Michael to ask the questions, my thoughts around what's going right, he asked us, is there something that's going right? And I would say uh, what's going right is that students are definitely taking advantage of the choices that are available to them. Uh, there are other things that are going right, but I think that's the main one. In terms of where we're struggling, there's lots of places where we're struggling, but if I was going to pick one, uh, I would focus on quality. There's Because we have so many schools, there's a wide range of practices within and between the schools. Uh, they sometimes feel they don't have their district support to be an effective program, and I certainly hear from um, teachers in the system as well, um, including some of the folks who are on this call. Um, and I guess it's what I'd like to learn more about because it's associated with one of the other struggles is, uh, and this comes up in some of the Teachers Federation reports as well, is interest in strategies that encourage neighborhood schools to see uh, their distributed learning school counterpart parts as resources for programs and not as competition because we do get that sense right now so much happening that perhaps these are um, competitive environments rather than um, uh, a way to provide a blend of services in a cohesive system. So those are, are my comments and I'll turn it over to uh, Michael and questions I guess. Well, the first question I saw come through was one that Christopher asked, and I know Darren and Tim got a chance to answer it because he asked it as, as I think Darren was speaking, but in the case of, of Morrison and Sarah, if you guys wanted to chime in on this, uh, Christopher had asked earlier if the content that had been developed that was provided to the online teachers, if the teachers had the ability to go in and modify that content or um, to create uh, their own courses. I don't know if the two of you want to speak to that or not. I'll go. Um, this is Sarah. Yes, the teachers in our online, the te sorry, the online teachers are more than free to um, modify the course. We have a set of course development standards that stipulate a uh, number of lessons within a course and how much activity must be synchronous and how much must be asynchronous, but uh, what we've tried to do, because we had to get up and running fairly quickly, was we we uh, were able to convince the school boards that had been offering online learning to donate their courses to us. And so um, some of the teachers who developed those courses are still teaching the online courses. Some of them are new to the online courses, and they are uh, modifying as they go along. Um, we are trying to help them as much as possible. One of the things that we have uh, here at the department is a support team that consists of a graphic designer and a back-end uh, learning content management system specialist and a technician. So their job is to um, help the teachers to find resources that they might need or to design resources that they might need or to help them if the tech technical stuff is not working. Basically, we want the teacher to just be able to teach the course. Um, we are working on a template approach to course development so that all the courses have the same look and feel. Um, and so basically, a teacher can take their content and just paste it into a template and it all um, it all is standardized on what a heading looks like and what a uh, diary, what a journal entry looks like, and it just so that the students will start to recognize elements of the courses. So I hope that answers the question. Um, at uh, my end, of course, uh, that's that's one of my responsibilities is, is working with people in terms of content development. So. Um, the uh, the answer is yes. People certainly are, are unable to edit their own content. I have to be clear, though, that 
that uh, when I'm talking about editing content, I mean editing the instructional content. Uh, education in, in my province is, is a, a, a pan-provincial issue when it comes to curriculum. That is, the Ministry of Education sets the curriculum outcomes. So for each course, and let's just say it's grade 11 physics, there is a provincially sanctioned curriculum guide and the outcomes, by the way, for everyone's information, are drawn from the Pan Canadian Protocol. So, um, so we, we don't dictate how people teach, but yes, we, we are pretty prescriptive when it comes to what people teach. Now, on that one topic, especially about, um, <laughs> sorry, Mike, <laughs> I'll go to music now, just just for badness. Anyway, um, so, so let's let's go to music because it's a really good example. Look, uh, when we're creating content in music, what we're finding, as you know, you would expect is that things like um, created with, with text and graphics and so on just don't cut because music is not like that. You know, the content needs to be multimedia in nature. So, so we have to either shoot video or write flash objects or, um, you know, if, if we don't have the money to do flash, we'll use Adobe Captivate and, and create content that way. And we keep coming full circle to the fact that creating good content is harder than most people think it is. So, so my job is to support people to, to find out what people need done and either show them how to do it themselves, give them the, the skills and tools to do it themselves, or to get it done for them. And that's not easy. I noticed Christopher had posted another question there that uh, actually Morse mentioned a little bit there in terms of saying that they had a, a design template that they're using and Sarah indicated that they're moving in that direction. But um, asking if there are any competencies for the instructional designers and teachers that they were using to help drive the um, editing that was doing for the online, the editing or I guess or development of the online courses. So are there any sort of list of standards would be another way of looking at it. Uh, the example Christopher uses is the IBSTIPI ones, uh, which are more of an industry type ones. But are there any specific standards um, that you use? And I guess while you're at that, he's asked another question about what kind of skills uh, do you give them? I, I assume you mean by technical skills in that respect. So any sort of design standards or technical skills that you provide the teachers to help them with these designs for, I guess, any of the four of you or all of the four of you? I'll hop in again since I click on the microphone. Um, we have, uh, when we're developing course, courses, we um, issue RFPs for course development. So, for example, we've issued about 12 RFPs currently to get various different courses developed. And the, the competences that we ask for are familiarity with online learning, uh, pedagogical knowledge of the Nova Scotia curriculum, that kind of thing. Once we've awarded the RFP, we bring the successful group together for a day-long training session and we show them how to use Moodle, how to use the video conferencing platform. Um, we give them an entire day with access to all the people that are going to help them and then we send them away and say, uh, if you need help, you just call us. So part of the content development um, agreement is that they will have access to the people here who will help them with whatever um, whatever they need in terms of getting their content into the Moodle. Since I uh, put my hand up, I will speak next. Um, what we do with our teachers, and we've done this from day one, is we try to stay away from new teachers. Um, Teaching online tends to be very similar to teaching in a fishbowl, so we, uh, we would like the teachers to have a fair amount of classroom experience and a fair amount of confidence in their teaching skills before we actually get them into the online environment. We also expect them to be content experts and know the Saskatchewan curriculum fairly extensively because if we don't follow the curriculum, uh, obviously there's going to be an issue with the courses that we offer. Uh, once they start to develop the course, we give them 200 hours of release time within their face-to-face -face school in order to develop the course. That's only about half the amount of time it takes for someone to develop that course. We don't select our teachers based on their technical skills, but in the last couple of years, 
because of the popularity of the cyber school, because of the number of teachers that want to get involved with our cyber school, we have made that a criteria now where the person has to be fairly computer literate before we want them involved. Uh, once they get involved, then we have all sorts of online supports to help them with whichever le learning management system we have. We have our resource person here within the office to help, and we also have a, uh, a fairly um, large group of people in each one of our main high schools who are also involved with the uh, with the online teaching or are teaching online presently and can help them. Um, each one of them, because they've gone through the experience of writing their own course, they know how much work it is and know how difficult it is that they uh, they have no problems at all offering up their expertise to help them out. When it comes to specific technical tasks that they have an issue with, for instance, how to use Flash or how to use uh, some other tools that they would use in their online classroom, then they can come to us and request that. We do what's called the Continuous Improvement Framework. Each month we give a task to our teachers to add an element to their course. So one week, one month it may be uh, you need to add a video into your course of you introducing yourself as the instructor. And then they learn how to use the video, they learn how to put that into their course, and then we find that we have more and more videos showing up. So we build what's called a continuous improvement framework, which hopefully enhances what goes on in the face-to-face -face classrooms. So this is Tim, and I'll also respond to um, Christopher's question. Uh, because we've delegated so much of the responsibility for delivery to schools, um, our guidelines are instructional standards and content standards uh, documents. The agreement that schools sign with the ministry says that they will hire based on um, expertise or proficiency, but knowing that it's possibly developmental because there aren't always the experienced people who have all of the skills. So they, are, if teachers don't already have skills, an expectation that they would use the standards documents to create sort of professional development plans for their educators. Some districts have been able to use the agreement uh, quite well in terms of ensuring that they can hire staff who have that expertise, but in others, um, as Chris says, the, the local union has been able to um, make the case that a teacher is a teacher uh, regardless of where or how, and so the um, um, that has constrained some districts on hiring uh, people with the right kind of expertise, but it seems to be very much locally uh, based on the strength of the local um, the local collective. Um, so we see both. We see schools that have been able to attract and train um, up, and we see other schools that have been quite constrained uh, by the local agreements to hire um, based on primarily on seniority rather than specific skills. I, mean, I think I'd like to take what what Tim is saying and run with it because I, I definitely see that 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 we've got some commonalities here. Um, the, the issue of you know, what's the difference between an e-teacher and a teacher is, is often a question that comes up. And it's generally been my experience that, that a teacher who has demonstrated proficiency in, in, in the face-to-face -face classroom is the kind of person you want to start with. And I say this because, because we do hire, uh, well, actually what we do in, in, in Newfoundland is we second people. So, so when it, when we see that we have staffing needs, what we'll do is the normal thing, right? We'll we'll we'll, we'll advertise for the fact that we're looking for um, an, an online music teacher and invite applications for secondment. Um, it's interesting. I've been at this for a very long time now, so I've sat through quite a few uh, job interviews and and I've learned a couple things that that are that are absolute red flags. Like when you ask the question, why do you want to work for CBOI. I mean, that's the one that really breaks it. Because some people will say, because I enjoy technology. And to me, that is a big red flag. Uh, uh, other people will say, because I need a break and I this and I that and I the other thing. Right? You're using that pronoun, I, I, I. That, that tells you, well, you know, you have a very self-centered individual here. But, but when you... <laughs> when, <laughs> When you uh, when you get the person talking about what the students will do and what you will do with the students, then all of a sudden 
but you know you probably got a live one. You probably got what you what you really want. So I guess the point that I'm making here, which is what I also put in the chat, which which is really to agree very much with with something Darren said, is that it is not the technical skills that we really look for here. It's the same soft skills that I put it to you and make it work in the classroom, the regular classroom. Just to briefly highlight on that. Um, a, a good teacher in a face-to-face -face classroom tends to be a good teacher online. And a good online course will be good because of the teacher, not because of the content and not because of what's going on. A teacher who really has the skills in order to put ideas across and to identify when there's an issue with a student and have all those skills that teachers have on how to identify uh, problem areas in a course, how to enhance their course to make things better and is always reevaluating re what they've done over and over again to make their course better will result in a very successful online course. If a teacher is there just because they think it's going to be an easy goal of it, the, then they will have problems for sure because they won't put the amount of effort that's necessary in order to create a successful online course. It's the same with the students. A student who thinks an online course is going to be easier than face-to-face -face and not willing to put the work in won't be successful either. So on doing work online as a teacher or doing it as a student is more work than it is in a face-to-face -face classroom. I guess just to pick up on that last comment that Darren made, and it's kind of nice how we're all playing off each other here, um, that idea of it being more work, and, and Morris can probably speak to this a little bit better. Um, I know the CDOI when they first started, and I think even still to this day, um, has, that, um, has always believed that to teach online requires more time and more effort than to teach in a face-to-face -face manner simply because the, the, the interactions are being mediated by technology. And um, The example one of the CDLI teachers always used to say to me was, you know, in the classroom you can look at a student and say, you know, if they don't understand something about World War One, you can look at them and say, well, you remember the Boer War, right? And just by the look on their face, you kind of know where you've got to start in terms of, of that background explanation. Uh, whereas in an online environment, first of all, it would take you a lot longer to type, you know, you remember the Boer War, um, than it would to simply say it, and that might require three or four or five emails before you figure out exactly where you've got to start with that remediation. And I know that when they first started, the, the CDLI used to cap its, its teachers um, at a lower level than what you'd see at the face-to-face -face in terms of maximum number of students. Um, so when I was a, stu a teacher in Bonavista, um, we had a 5 by 14 timetable, and so I taught 6 out of 7 slots, and I had an average class size of about 30, so on a daily basis I'd interact with probably about 180 kids, and, and Morris can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that most CDLI teachers probably have in the range of 120 to 150 kids, so, um, you know, which would be somewhere in the vicinity of about 75 to 85 percent of what I had as a rural classroom teacher. And Morris indicates a little bit less than that. So, um, you know, that there is a good example of, of um, you know, how they requires more work in the online environment. And also one of the reasons why, um, and I think this is one of the things we try to make uh, apparent in the report, is one of the reasons why most of the provincial teachers unions have been consciously supportive of the online learning environment. Uh, you know, if we were to move every bit of education in Newfoundland to an online format using the, the CDLI's model, um, they'd need more teachers, not fewer teachers. Uh, whereas I think in the United States, the, the pushback that you see coming from unions tends to be because online learning is a way of, of decreasing the number of teachers and for that matter also getting rid of any sort of union influence, which tends not to happen in the Canadian context. Um, looking at the time, we've got about two minutes left here and um, looking at a couple of the um, questions that have come through, I noticed that Merlin had one a little bit and we had talked a little bit about course content and how it was developed. Um, he specifically asked, do providers develop their own content, work collaboratively with other providers, or rely on ministry-developed content which they can modify for their own purposes? I don't know if any of the four want to take a swing at that in the uh, chat window or via the voice. Um, the other question that I see coming through was um, Christopher asks if there would be an interest in um, creating a competency list. 
uh, for online educators, um, similar to the one that Estipi has created, although you could also say similar to the one that INACO has created, although um, in the case of the Estipi ones, at least they are research-based competencies. Um, so if either of the panelists want to take a swing at one of those two questions in the last minute or so that we have. I can speak briefly to the, the one that I just typed up there. If if you're a teacher within our cyber school and you decide that you don't want to continue on with the cyber school, we have a course that's already developed. So our division has already paid for 200 hours of development time for that course. We pass that course on to the new teacher. Now what ends up happening is that teacher will teach in exactly the same style that that course was developed at the very beginning. But it, in time, I expect them to change that course to fit their approach to online education. And you cannot just take the course over and teach exactly what's there and just keep on going along and just teach the same thing year after year. A course has to continue to be developed all the time and get better and better as it is being taught. So a course that's been taught for five years is much better than a course that has only been taught for one year. Um, I can address a little bit what happens in Nova Scotia. We have, uh, we did have two school boards that were offering distance learning, and so there was some duplication of courses between those two school boards when it became amalgamated within the province. Um, so we're sort of picking and choosing the best elements of each course to make a skeleton, which is then available to. Um, be used by the online teacher, and the online teacher is free to modify whatever they need to as long as they are um, achieving the curriculum outcomes that are prescribed by the province and as long as uh, they're following the evaluation and assessment practices that are supposed to be used. So um, we develop a skeleton and then it's available to be um, updated and as the speaker before me said, um, a course that's been taught for five years is much better than a course that's only been taught once because it becomes more and more polished as the teacher gets more familiar with it. I do want to be conscious and respectful of people's time and so it is a couple minutes after a full hour and before too many people have to leave I want to um, thank Michael as well as all of our panelists for um, excellent discussion. Um, we are more than welcome to continue some back and forth discussion and we'll keep the recording on but just recognize that some people might have um, only out Located an hour and need um, to leave at this point, but then they could um, up under the recording and hear the last portion. So I will turn it back to Michael. As long as people are available, um, we can continue this excellent discussion. It was interesting, Matt jumped on the mic just before I was uh, about to turn it back over to. So um, let me add my thanks to, to Morris, Sarah, and, and Darren. Um, I see a couple of them have indicated that they are able to stay, and I noticed um, in terms of the last couple of questions, you saw a lot of uh, answers being given in, in the chat box in addition to what you heard um, in the um, from Darren and from Sarah in terms of the, the, the chat. Um, I haven't seen any new questions come up, so I, I'll hang out for a minute or two to see if there are any additional questions that get uh, raised here um, and Sarah's indicating that she has to leave so um, Sarah if anything does come up that I think is particularly applicable to you I'll get an email address and make sure I connect the, the two of you um, afterwards and, and thank you again for coming and um, like I said I'll hang on for a minute or two here to see if there are any final questions um, but not seeing much in the chat window Thank you for the opportunity, Mike. I really did enjoy this. And uh, any other time you'd like me to come and chat up uh, what we do here online, you know I always like to share. So feel free to contact me.
I should also note that we'll be doing a similar session uh, that the Canadian Institute for Distance Education Research, CIDR, will be hosting. And I think that's going to be coming up sometime in May. Uh, so if you follow my blog or anything like that, you'll see that there. And what I'll try to do is get a, a different group of panelists just so we can uh, get perspectives from all over the country. So at INACL at the Virtual School Symposium, I think we had folks from uh, schools in BC, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. And today we had uh, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, and, and BC. Uh, so we need to get Manitoba and New Brunswick in there and, and the territories in PEI to round them out. But um, that'll be another time. I'm not seeing any additional questions uh, showing up in the box. So I'll thank uh, the per panelists that are still here and I'll thank everyone who is still around for um, coming with us today. And uh, other than that, like I say, I'll just hang out here for a minute to, to see if there are any final questions. Uh, but otherwise, thank you all for coming and have a great day. Hi, Chris. Um, this is my voice. What would you like me to explain? I'm not sure what that's in relation to. Well, what you asked earlier if there would be interest in a competencies list. Now, there's a couple of those that exist. So our role here in terms of a competency list is, if there are such things, is to make schools aware that they exist to help them in their practice. Um, and sometimes principals of those schools aren't aware that such things exist, and they would probably help them guide their conversations with their, um, with their teachers. I'm not sure what you mean by your question. Um, I thought when you were talking about competencies, it was teaching competencies rather than course quality criteria. They're quite different things, but both are important to share. Well, we're hearing no more questions, and um, seeing that the audience has dwindled down to just about the moderators, I am going to end the recording and um, disconnect the phone conference line.